Who is eligible for CAR T cell therapy? CAR T cells uh, are, have been approved in uh, multiple uh, settings uh, for patients with relapsed myeloma. Uh, in, initially, those uh, products, uh, the two products that are currently available, uh, Siltacel and Idacel, were available for patients with heavily relapsed myeloma. Based on some other trials comparing Siltacel or Idacel to some standard regimens that, be, that we would typically use after, uh, after one or two or three prior types of myeloma treatment, those, uh, those products were seen to be better than some of the standard treatments we had available and now have been, become FDA approved in earlier lines of therapy. So after uh, one line of therapy, uh, Siltacel uh, is, has been available, and after two or more lines of therapy, uh, Idacel has become available. Uh, for, for patients generally as a standard of care approach. Um, so there are efforts to look at uh, CAR T cells in, in earlier you know, settings, uh, potentially considering some use of CAR T cells in patients who had completed their initial therapy for myeloma and an autologous transplant. If they'd had an insufficient response uh, to that whole treatment program. I know of at least one trial where they are enrolling some patients to consider CAR-Ts uh, after that. Uh, but I, I do see in the future that there will likely be more trials that are including CAR-T cells as part of frontline therapy. Um, but I, I think we're probably some years away from knowing uh, how soon patients might be you know, considering getting access to CAR-T uh, earlier than their current uh, FDA-approved indications. Besides the label indication FDA eligibility criteria, what other things should be considered before going forward with CAR-T therapy? CAR-T uh, is a, a, a type of treatment that can be complex. Uh, it can require uh, lead time for manufacturing, requires uh, close contact with the clinic, uh, it requires patients to have good fitness, uh, uh, they should be able to uh, handle some of the side effects that may come up from uh, delivery of CAR T cells, including cytokine release syndrome and the possible, although less common, risk of some neurologic issues with CAR T. Um, in, in general, uh, the uh, I think many patients are, are good candidates for CAR T. Uh, the uh, we want to make sure they're fit, their heart, lung, and kidney function are good, uh, that they have a uh, preferably a, as good an option uh, to get them with to the CAR-T under good disease control uh, and that they have uh, the right support systems in place uh, after CAR-T to get them through the early post-CAR-T period when they might be at more risk of having certain side effects. Uh, so having a caregiver support uh, in, uh, process in place uh, being able to get to and from the, the center is important, uh, at least in our center, and I know at, at others, uh, for patients who come from a great distance, they might need to uh, temporarily relocate to be within a certain radius of, of the center so that if some issue comes up, they have the ability to get care from the, 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 key, the team at the center that has experience with managing the CAR-T-related side effects. Uh, all of these, uh, you know, really uh, important and complicated factors play a role, but there are, there are many patients who are uh, good candidates, and, and I think that uh, as we get uh, more experience with CAR-T uh, and, and uh, expand our ability to deliver it to more patients, I, I think it's going to be good for a, a wider group of people. So CAR T cell therapy has been a fantastic addition to our armamentarium against myeloma. But right now, I don't think everyone can get CAR T cells because of the toxicity piece mostly. I would say that for standard of care, patients who have had at least four lines of therapy, so four different times that they've had change of therapy is required for both our new products that have come out. And usually it's patients that have to have an ECOG performance status of zero to one. So these are patients that are you know otherwise doing really well and healthy. I will say that when it's standard of care, we have some patients that maybe aren't in that ECOG zero to one, maybe two. And again, patients whose kidney functions and liver function and heart function are, are relatively okay. Because again, it's a toxicity piece. And hopefully as we 
learn more and more, we'll be able to get more patients on. For clinical trials, there's a you know hard stop in terms of you have to have um, ECOG of zero to one, your platelets have to be greater than 50 to 100, your neutrophil count has to be greater than one, your platelets have to be greater than 50, or your um, hemoglobin has to be greater than eight. So there's a lot more, in terms of eligibility criteria with, with trials, they're a lot more strict. Um, however, instead of four lines, we have trials that are now doing, you know, CAR T in the second, third line, up front, combination with other drugs. Um, so both Idacel and Sultacel have multiple um, trials that they're looking at different time points. So we're excited about one that's gonna come out in Europe um, that they're gonna look against transplant versus CAR T for Sultacel, that'll be really exciting. And then in the U.S., we have trials looking at CAR T maybe right after transplant. Um, so a lot of data, hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, that we'll learn a lot more from. Eligibility criteria of how the patient is, whether you, you think that patient will be eligible for CAR T or not, is based on the patient factors, the disease factors, and the treatment-related factors. What I meant to say is that the, somebody is how old is the patient, how how is the performance status of the patient, you know, what are the other comorbidities the patient has. What kind of disease burden the patient has? Is the disease relapsing very fast or the disease relapsing slowly? And what are the other treatment related issues the patient has? What are the prior toxicities this patient has? If the patient has baseline kidney dysfunction, the patient has baseline neurological dysfunction. So these are the that things needs to be factored into account in addition to the eligibility, the, what is the label has been mentioned. Uh, and that is how we decide the eligibility of the patient for the CAR T. Are there any age restrictions that may exclude an individual from CAR-T therapy? These are by far lower doses of chemotherapy than what we use in transplant conditioning, which also allows us to address the average age group that these diseases are common in. So we routinely treat with CAR-T cells people older than 70, and we've treated a number of patients older than age 80. And the registry data in the United States, at least, shows that patients up to age 91 have been treated with CAR T cells. So we have no concern in doing this in older individuals, and we do not use age as a barrier or as a parameter for eligibility or whether it's appropriate to use CAR T cells. I think this is a really important, you know, cutting edge question of kind of where we are today in the myeloma field, and it's a challenging question. Certainly, we've seen from uh, at least in the second line setting, the trial that led to the approval of Siltacel, a, a CAR-2-4 trial, showed some great benefits for some of our patients who get CAR-T over the standard available therapies, including, you know, potential. Uh, we know that it, it uh, extends the amount of time until the patient needs a different type of myeloma treatment greatly. And, you know, recently I think the trial had also shown some survival benefits for those patients who got CAR-T. However, CAR T has some issues with it. Um, there are some uh, complex side effects and complications that can come from CAR T that one needs to consider in the risk benefit analysis that each patient and provider must go through to decide whether or not it's the right fit for a patient at that point in time. Uh, some common issues that can come up with CAR T, uh, you know, the, the side effects that happen during the process, like cytokine release syndrome or immune cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome or neurotoxicity can happen. Those are really short term and likely temporary issues. However, we've also seen some uh, more uncommon complications of CAR T that uh, are you know, worrisome, including uh, there's been some rare, rare cases of uh, more permanent neurologic dysfunction, uh, nerve injury, uh, some, some rare cases of uh, Parkinsonism. Uh, additionally, uh, second cancers, I think, is another major concern that is a more commonly seen issue. I wouldn't say it's common, but I'd say that it's a bigger problem than some of the, the neurologic concerns, although the neurologic concerns are certainly scary. Um, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome has been a, a, a problem that's been seen in uh, both using, you know, both of our available CAR-T products, likely related to patient's prior treatment exposure history to certain types of chemotherapy, as well as potentially some of the chemotherapy that's used for the lymphodepletion to make room in the body for the CAR T cells. Uh, and uh, really the possibility of, of second cancers, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a risk that is a known problem with CAR T. And I, I think that that is something that we need to take into account when deciding whether or not someone should go to CAR T next. 
Um, uh, there are other quite rare entities like T-cell cancers that have been seen, but those are really, I think, uh, uh, much rarer entities. And I, I think w I would say that's probably not a reason not to do it. But um, to, to kind of summarize, I think uh, the, there's a pr great promise and there's a lot of positive results that we've seen from use of CAR-T and having more treatment options available to get to CAR-T under better disease control is more easily done in the second line setting than after that. However, the risks of second cancers, the complexity of CAR-T, the need for you know, hospital admission, taking time out of your life to go through the process, uh, is complex and, and all of those decisions need to be made on an individualized basis between the patient and their caregiver and, the, and their physicians. I don't always think they should. <laughs> um, certainly um, my patients who have uh, high risk disease, uh, those patients who, who may have some, already have some worrisome signs of a, either aggressive type of myeloma, uh, potentially those patients who might have a history of plasma cytomas, for example, um, those patients uh, and, uh, worry me, and, and those are the people in whom I'm more likely to lean towards doing it earlier rather than later. Um, but, um, you know, for those patients who've had, you know, let's say an excellent, you know, response to initial therapy, what appears to be not a rapidly growing uh, aggressive high-risk high type of myeloma, uh, there are a number of great options for use in, in, in second and, and line therapy that are not CAR-T, and I think those are still viable choices. Um, I always just like to try to uh, think a few moves ahead and to, to think about where I might be with a particular patient that we're making this decision with. Where are we going to be in the third line setting? What are we going to have available to us? And that's always an important calculation we need to make to determine, you know, whether it's time to do CAR-T now or whether we should do something else that isn't CAR-T and consider returning to CAR-T later. Um, and, you know, always, always hard to try to predict the future, but you, you always want to think about how, do I, how can I maximize the amount of treatment options that my, my patient has mm -hmm. uh, to try to you know, help them get the best outcome possible. You want to maximize their options. So uh, in scenarios where I think I might have CAR-T as an option now, but for some patient-related reason or some other reason, I might not have access to it later, that might also be a reason why I might think about doing it now. But this is a complicated discussion. I think that we really need to do as, as best a job as we can to educate the patients about the risks and the benefits of CAR-T because there are great risks and potential great benefits, both. Um, but, you know, I think it is a really valuable treatment approach. But deciding when to do it and when to do it later or not to do it is a, a complex decision that uh, it requires a, a, a important conversations with our patients that need to help us get to that conclusion.